one three three two Zulu. Wind three two zero at one zero. Peak gusts two zero. Visibility four. Rain mist. Sky condition overcast two thousand seven hundred. Temperature zero four. Greetings viewers and welcome to another video featuring the mighty Rockwell Turbo Commander. In this video, I'll take you through a recent non-precision approach I flew into Safford, Arizona. The weather was rather tame and it did not require flying to minimums, but we do pass the final approach fix in IMC and get to deal with a little ice and rain. Number 790 Bravo Echo Descent at Pots Discretion Maintain 11,000. Pots Discretion 11,000, Bravo Echo. Turbo Commander, 790 Bravo Echo, and uh, cross San Simone at or above 1010,000 cleared RNAV runway 30 approach Stafford. Cross uh, at or above uh, 10,000 San Simone cleared for the RNAV 30 Stafford, 79 Bravo Echo. We will talk about how I brief my approaches the standard non-precision profile for the Turbo Commander and discuss the ice protection systems that are installed on the Turbo Commander. Should be a fun ride. Hopefully you will find the information useful in your own instrument flying. If you notice that the plate had an LPV, and I'm talking about a non-precision approach, the reason is I never end up getting vertical guidance, so I end up shooting the approach as an LNAV only with an MDA. Number 79 of Bravo Echo, on my radar I'm showing some moderate precipitation starting uh, just near yeah, Gedzu. Actually, it's about uh, 15 miles to the southeast of Stafford. And it's scattered pretty much all the way until Stafford. 7-9, Bravo Echo. The Garmin GTN 750 on board is treating the San Simone VOR as a flyby waypoint. It's activated the turn anticipation algorithm, causing the autopilot to never actually fly over the VOR as it establishes the aircraft on the 23 mile initial approach segment. Now normally I would have slowed the aircraft to about 160 knots in a clean configuration outside the initial approach fix. But because the initial approach segment is so long, I'm going to keep my speed up around 190 knots until I get closer to the intermediate fix. Number 79 at Bravo Echo, and uh, it does look like that precipitation is dissipating, but yeah, still showing it just near Gedzu, scattered all the way to Stafford. And report your cancellation of IFR on this frequency or is flight service change to advise the frequency of truth. 7 I Bravo Echo. We can see the weather the ATC controller warned us about just ahead of the aircraft. Let me take you through how I brief my approaches. I fly single pilot, but I also brief aloud. There have been studies done that suggest that reading checklists and approaches aloud in a single pilot environment has a cognitive benefit, so treat it as another tool in your SRM tool bag. I like to use the approach plate briefing as a checklist. As I brief an item, I will do an associated task related to that item. I also brief in a logical sequence that mirrors the flight's progression. I start with the top right of the plate. This will be the RNAV runway 30 approach in the Safford. At this point, the approach is loaded into the GPS. The final approach course will be 303 degrees. Next, I walk through the frequencies. The ASOS is 124.175. I tune this on the COM2 and listen to the weather. The wind direction will determine if this will be a straight in or circling approach later in the brief. Also, I ensure the altimeter is set correctly in the aircraft. I confirm I am on center's frequency, 134.45. And finally, I preload the common traffic advisory frequency, 122.8, in my COM1 standby. So it is ready when it's time to switch over. Next, I come down to the plan view of the chart and walk my way through all the waypoints not depicted on the profile view. After crossing San Simone, we will descend to 7,300 feet and fly a heading of 330 for 23 miles. Now I can transition the briefing to the profile view. At Gedzu, I'll turn to 304 and descend to 7,200 feet. At Fimnu, I'll fly 303 and descend to cross Ebvoy, the final approach fix, at 5,800. As I am briefing these waypoints, I am also confirming their existence in the GPS approach flight plan. Because this will be an LNAV only, I will cross Zumo at 4,480 feet before descending to the MDA. I come down to the landing minimums at this point. The Turbo Commander falls in Category B 
for the approach because its V-Rep is 100 knots. This will be an LNAV approach, so the MDA will be 3,860 feet, which I will round up to 3,900 feet. I place this number in the Garmin 600's minimum alerter. I will need one mile of visibility to complete the approach. If I have to go mist, I will climb straight ahead to 10,000 feet, then direct to Aruju. I only brief the first two tasks. Briefing any more would just be a waste because it will probably be forgotten anyways. Once I am established in the mist, I will have time to review the additional procedures required. Next, I move to the airport diagram and make a mental picture of what the airport layout should look like when I break out. Am I coming straight in or am I coming in at an angle? If I were to be conducting a circuit of land, I would determine at this point exactly how I would execute that maneuver. You do not want to break out with no pre-plan on how you intend to circle. The last thing I brief is the minimum safe altitude. If everything goes to hell in a handbasket and I lose all navigation, what is my escape plan? In this case, minimum safe altitude is 12,000 feet in all quadrants around runway 30. Thank God for iPads. Of course, in a multi-crew environment, the briefing ends with, are there any questions? Let me take you through the standard non-precision approach profile for the commander. Prior to the arrival at the initial approach fix, we want to have completed the approach briefing as well as the descent checklist. The descent checklist goes as such, pressure cabin altitude set, ice protection ignition override as required, avionics set, ATIS obtained, nav flight instruments set, power levers set for descent, approach briefing complete. Within about 5 miles of the fix we want to bring the power back to 250 aside in a clean configuration. This should give us a speed of about 160 knots as we cross over the fix. Crossing the intermediate fix, we slow to 140 knots and complete the before landing checklist. This checklist includes prop sync off, landing gear down, three green, hydraulic pressure check, lights as required, ice protection, ignition override as required, flaps as required, condition levers, high RPM. Just prior to the final approach fix, I will extend the flaps to approach, which is half flaps. This will allow the plane to settle into the new configuration before it's time to go down. Scout 30, or correction, Scout 5856, clear direct harbor. At the final approach fix, the gear comes down and we settle into 120 knots indicated descent to the MDA. Just remember, gear down to go down. Once the runway is in sight and the landing is assured, flaps go full and speed can be reduced to V-Rep, which is about 100 knots indicated. At altitude, 120.907. 20.97, we'll see American Pfizer, sir. I would like to tell you a little bit about the ice protection systems on the Turbo Commander. The commander is certified for flight into known icing, commonly referred to as FIKI. In order to achieve this capability, there are a number of anti-ice and de-ice systems on the aircraft. The primary de-ice system is the wing leading edge boots. These neoprene boots extend from the outboard of the engine cell to the tip of the wing. They are pneumatically actuated from regulated bleed air. Both the horizontal and vertical stabilizers also have pneumatic boots. This gauge tells the pilot the regulated air is at the correct pressure to activate the boots. The propellers have electrical heating elements located at the root of each blade. The engine's lower nose ring assembly, or smile, is heated with bleed air from the engine. The hot air is pumped into the nose ring assembly where it circulates before exiting via an outboard vent tube. The windshield has electrical heating elements embedded between layers of laminated glass. These should be used in an anti-ice roll. You have both high and low settings which heat different portions on the windshield. The heating elements will create an electromagnetic field that will make your wet compass essentially useless. The stall warning vane on the right wing leading edge is also electrically heated, as well as the fuel vents on the underside of both the left and right wing. And finally, both pitot tubes, located on the left and right side of the forward fuselage, are heated. You can see there are trace amounts of rime ice forming on the leading edge of the wing and the tip of the spinner. You can identify rime ice by its snow cone texture. This is nothing to be concerned about and would not justify activation of the boots at this point.
We are now approaching the final approach fix. Notice it has become considerably darker as we enter the area that was depicted in yellow on the radar. Greater precipitation of some sort is just ahead. We are now crossing the final approach fix at about 5,900 feet. Now I want you to pay close attention to that wiper blade on the windshield over the next few moments. Notice the blade has a very crisp, defined straight edge. Watch what happens to that straight edge as we enter an area of icing. That's ice, and it's accumulating very quickly. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Can't help you now, brother. Fortunately, the temperature is about to warm up, and that ice is going to disappear rapidly. Here comes that final step down at Zumo. I'm about 350 feet higher than I should be. Finally, we have descended into warmer air and rain begins to pelt the aircraft. The first signs of ground contact are the lights of houses just below us. It's important that we still stay on the gauges at this point. Probably a wise idea to turn on the airport lights at this point. Might make it a little easier to get visual on the airport. Out of the murkiness, we break out at 1,000 feet AGL and finally see the welcoming lights of the airport just ahead. Traffic, traffic Commander 9 Bravo goes on final 30 full stop sir. Since conditions are marginal VFR, I could cancel my IFR clearance at this point, but I cannot reach Albuquerque Center at this altitude in Safford due to the mountains. So we'll cancel the IFR clearance once we're on the ground. 500. Those flashing strobes on either side of the runway are called runway end identifier lights, or reels for short. They help the pilot find the approach end of the runway in limited visibility conditions. Minimums. Minimums. The Pappy two red lights on the left side of the runway are telling us the approach is low. If it showed red and white, we would be on a three degree glide path. Okay, no high fives just yet. We still have to get the plane slowed down on a wet and slick runway. Fortunately, winds are almost down the runway, so the deceleration will be uneventful. Remember to fly the plane all the way to the parking position. The nice thing about the commander is that we have props that can reverse. So even if we have no traction on the tires or control with the brakes, we can maintain directional control with the props. In the Premier, we had only anti-lock brakes, so I was always wondering how the plane would perform trying to stop after landing on an icy or heavily contaminated runway. Fortunately, I never had to find out, and no one ever had a good answer for me. Hope you enjoyed tagging along on the flight. If you love the Turbo Commander, check out my other videos. Real excited about my next video, which will showcase flying an air-to-air -air photo shoot. Look for that video in the near future. Until then, remember there are pilots who have flown the same hour a thousand times, and then there are those pilots who have flown a thousand hours. Always try to be the latter, push beyond your comfort level, and keep learning and growing. Fly safe.